Well, good morning again. So, I actually inspired myself last week. It doesn't happen very often. But I am in such awe all the time of God. I'm in such awe of his awesome power. And, and when we did the sermon last week on nature and talked about how we can see God in every part of it, I, I really left here just inspired. I went home, I sat outside by the garden, and I just watched. I just, it was just so cool, you know? And, and I wanted to continue that this week. I wanted to keep talking about the awesomeness of, of God. And last week was more about biology and how it affects a nature. This week is more about mathematical physics, and I knew you'd be really excited about that <laughs> as well as I am. Um, and so this is not, I'm not talking about evolution or any of that today. We're going to, I'm going to talk about the concepts involved in where this disbelief of God comes from. I don't understand, I, I, I don't understand a, as a scientist, as a mathematician, how anyone in this field of science or engineering or technology, how you can go delve more and more into your field and not have 100% total faith and confidence that there is only one ultimate creator of the universe, and that is God. I don't get it. I don't know why there is such a fight amongst people, particularly who try to intellectualize reasons other than God. I don't get it. I don't get it. Because this is so easy, and it makes so much sense, so much more sense than other things. So I wanted to talk today about the power of God's word, the spoken word from God, and how it put everything into motion to where we are and what we have uh, today. Ezekiel 43, 1 through 3 says, Then the man brought me to the gate facing east. East. And I saw the glory of God of Israel coming from the east. And his voice was like the roar of rushing waters, and the land was radiant with his glory. Oh, amen. So I wanted to start talking about this idea of the Big Bang Theory. Now, I like to tell people I believe in the Big Bang Theory. God said it, and bang, it happened. That's my concept of the Big Bang Theory. But the basic idea is that this is that the Big Bang Theory says that the universe actually created itself. Think about that, right? Because we have this point, what's called singularity, and that's right here, where everything that's ever been was compressed into like something like the size so small that it actually was immeasurable. It's, it's sometimes referred to as a Planck length. Um, a Planck length is... Uh, the distance that a photon will travel um, 1 point, it's 1.62 times 10 to the minus 35 seconds. I mean, think about, it's the smallest measurable time, I'm sorry, that's the distance of it. And, and we get this quantum time from it. It's the smallest measurable time that there is um, in the universe. And it actually comes down to 10 to the minus 43 seconds. So that's point 43 zeros and a one. That's, that's almost as small an amount of time as if you're in New York City between when the light turns green and the person behind you honks. Because <laughs> I always thought that was the smallest measurable time. But in fact, it's this thing called the Planck time. And what happened is in the beginning of time, between, well, I may have it in here. We'll talk about it. Um, well, it, it doesn't. But between the time that that Big Bang occurred and they have what's called inflation, which is different than the inflation we're looking at now, is 10 to the minus 
33, 34 seconds, millions of billions of billions of a second, that the universe expanded more than it has in the last, according to scientists, 17 billion years. The problem is, is that this breaks down, um, it breaks down when we try to compare the theories and the measurements of the heavenly bodies to that of these small little numbers that we're talking about. This is what quantum theory is about. So there's an immense amount of confusion about how this could have possibly happened. And the big question, as you know, is what was there before there was the Big Bang Theory, right? Because, and, and this is that period of singularity, and this is what scientists can't explain. And when physicists can't explain something, you know what they do? They make something up. <laughs> right? They make it up to try to fit their narrative. It is absolutely true. Almost like medicine sometimes. Amen. But for us believers, there is no confusion about this. God spoke it, bang, and the universe existed. What happened before time? See, here's the thing to remember. When the Big Bang, before the Big Bang, there was no time. No time and no space. That's what physicists will tell you. And then, bang. All this from the singularity, the universe expands to, to this inflation to this point in that first 10 to the minus 36 seconds, and then time begins. It's kind of crazy if you ask me, but nobody did. They just wrote these books and had these theories anyway. So what happened during that 10 to the minus 36 seconds? Ask somebody who studies this, and what they'll tell you is they don't know. We just don't know what happened during that time. So we'll make something up. Psalms 92 says, before the mountains were born, or you brought forth the whole world from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. What is it saying here? Where, when, where is everlasting? How do you measure everlasting? Where does that exist in the context of the universe? It means that you existed before there was ever anything and you'll exist till after there is ever anything. And I got to tell you, you know, in my little human brain, I got a hard time sometimes figuring out, picturing, if you will, what that means. I mean, have you ever thought about infinity? Really thought about what infinity is or what it means? So let me ask you something. How many odd numbers are there uh, in, in all of the number set? An infinite number. And how many even numbers are there? Okay. How many square roots are there? But how would that be possible if a square root is less than the total number of numbers? So let's say I take the infinite set of even numbers and I divide it by two. Now how many numbers are there? There's an infinite number. And, and I accept the fact that that's too big for my brain to be able to understand. So I get it why physicists can't understand the complexity of the creation of the entire universe. Because it's bigger than humans can describe because it's not a natural event. It is what? Supernatural. It is a supernatural event. Job 36, 26 says, how great is God beyond our understanding. The number of his years is what? Past finding out. So quit trying to figure it out, he says. Revelation 4, 11 says, you are worthy, O Lord our God, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created what? All things. And they exist because you created what you Please, in Revelation 22, 13 says, I am the Alpha, Alpha, and the Omega. What is the Alpha and the Omega? It's the first and last letters of the Greek alphabet. This was to try to give them an idea that I am the beginning and I am the end. So what happens 
When they can't explain it, they come up with something else. And so what's the new idea behind how the universe was created? It's called string theory. And string theory is very complex and it's very mathematically oriented. And the basic concept is that instead of all these little quirks and quarks and little things from the pinpoint that it was expanded, that all energy and matter are made up of small little rubber bands that float in space and time. Now listen. Now listen. Now I make it tighter. And it changes the tone depending on how much tension is on a string, right? We know that with pianos and guitars, it changes the sound of the note. You agree with that? Is that right? Okay. So how small are those strings? Well, they're about a plank length. Or about 10 to the minus 35 meters. Or it comes out to be about a millionth of a billionth of a billionth of an inch. Now, why would they pick that size? I always wondered that. Why would they say it's a plank length? Well, first of all, how do you know that? I mean, I have a micrometer at home, and I can measure the thickness of a human hair with it. How do you measure the plank length? How would they know? How would they measure it? The truth is, you can't. <laughs> we have no way to measure a plank length. So it's pretty easy to say it's a plank length when you can't prove it mm -hmm. or you can't what? Disprove it. You know, I remember when um, we got in trouble one time uh, and one of the kids that um, was involved with us, him and his family moved away and Nobody ever heard or saw from him again. So guess who we blamed when it came time? Why would we blame someone that's not there? They can't defend themselves. So this is the theory, is that these tiny little strings. It's a subset of the Big Bang Theory, but it, what it does is it explains what happened during this period of singularity. And it's something that was created to explain away that there's an ordered design to the universe. Because the way the Big Bang Theory works, we wouldn't see this order and this homogeneity amongst us within the universe itself. Strings cannot be seen, and the theory cannot be tested. <laughs> How convenient is that? Where do we get the start from this? Well, it was from Sir Isaac Newton. And this was, I, so what happens is Einstein's theory of relativity explains a way, there's mathematical formula that we can use in order to better understand the structure and the makeup of large bodies, planets, uh, stars, and space itself. But the math breaks down as you get smaller and smaller and when you get to the microscopic level, the atomic level, it doesn't work anymore. So we come up with quantum theory. Quantum field theory is used to explain what happens in the atomic and subatomic um, areas. It's interesting, like if I want to measure the speed of an electron, right, within an atom, I have to get really, really close to that electron. But what happens the closer I get to the electron? It changes the speed of it. So how do I measure it? If the closer I get, the less accurate it gets. But I got to get really close in order to measure it. And when you take those calculations and you apply them to space time, well, the math doesn't work anymore. So this is where they wanted to come out with this idea of a unified theory. And I know you've heard that. And there's actually, unfortunately, a very um, uh, uncomplimentary name, a cursing word that they use, I'm not going to say it. And it actually had nothing to do with, um, with what they call the God particle. It just had to do with somebody used the Lord's name in vain during a conference and everyone thought that's what they were saying. And, and like, um, who was it that said when you speak a lie, was that you Anthony? You speak a lie often enough it becomes the truth. Yeah. That's right. And that's exactly what happened. It attempts to provide a unified description to the fundamental structure of the entire universe. 
So in order to do this, we have to have this idea of dimensionality. So be, before string theory came about, there was a belief that the unified theory was tied in this idea of 11 dimensions. And, and again, it's hard for us to imagine because we live in a world of what? How many dimensions? Four. I'm going to go through them in just a minute. The 11 dimensional space time um, theory was compactified, right? Because we already have four dimensions that we know of. So the other seven dimensions had to be compacted onto the seven dimensional sphere. And I'm going to read you some stuff from Ezekiel, right? Remember the vision that Ezekiel had? Whoa. It, I've seen artists try to put that into artwork, and they can't do it justice. And I read it again last night, and I read it again this morning, and it blows my mind what he must have seen in vision, how supernatural that event must have been. So let's talk about our four space-time dimensions, or our, our space-time dimensions. We have, um, we have to have 11 dimensions. It's defined by the number of a data point, right? So, so a dimension has to be identified by some location. So we have... Um, one-dimensional space, which is a line, and two-dimensional, which is a plane, and three-dimensional, which occupies space, and, and fourth-dimensional, which occupies time. I may have showed you these years ago, but I'll show you again. So let's say uh, I'm going go, um, um, uh, go, to go, I'm going to go and see Susan. I'm done. I'm out in the field, and I'm coming back to see Susan, and I know her address, and her address is 12. And that's 12 along the number line. So to go see her, all I have to do is I just have to walk and let's say take 12 steps and when I get to 12 I can say hey honey I'm home <laughs> except I spelled hi wrong I'm gonna have to fix that okay now what if I lived in a two-dimensional space Susan's location would be defined by two numbers there would be an x-axis and there would be a y-axis as well so she might say Oh, why don't you come see me? I'm at 12, 17. Okay? So I would go 12 to the right. I would go 17 to the, or straight, and then 17 to the left. And now I'm there. Okay? Three-dimensional says I occupy a space beyond just a plane, and now there's depth to it. So Susan might say, hey, why don't you come visit me? I'm at 12 comma, 17, comma, 22. So maybe she's in a particular apartment on the 22nd floor of a building. So I would go over 12, and I would then go to the left 17, and then I would take the elevator up, or the stairs up, to the 22nd floor. And now I'm there. Time is the exact same position in a three-dimensional space, but what's the difference? It's when I'm there. Let me try to explain it this way. Where I am standing right now existed at 6 o'clock this morning, right? If you would have come to church at 6 this morning, you would have seen this space. Would you have seen me? No. no. So, so from a three-dimensional perspective, this all exists in this space component. But from a time perspective, which is another dimension, I wasn't here. But I'm here now. And this afternoon, I won't be here anymore. But I will still exist, and so will what? The space. So will the space. And these are the four dimensions that we live in. But what about there being another seven dimensions? I don't know. Are there other dimensions? I think so. And I'm going to show you where I think the Bible explains that to us. The part of it is that where we have a hard time, I'll speak for me, where I have a hard time understanding some of the concepts that come biblically, where I have a hard time grasping supernatural concepts, constructs, and ideas, is because I am raised in a world where if you don't see it, it doesn't exist. If I can't imagine it, it's not possible. How self-righteous could that be? In essence, what I'm saying is, 
I, that God cannot have any more knowledge than me. That's a pretty dangerous place to be. When I close my mind to spiritual awareness, then I'm in trouble. You know, we won't get into it today. But for me, this is why I don't believe that science and religion will ever work together. And I've read articles where people say they do. But science is based on being able to explain natural events using natural evidence. Supernatural is where we talk about things that are not natural that occur, and there is no natural explanation in science, like the parting of the Red Sea. Last week, we talked about the floating of the axe head and the violation of Archimedes' principle, or, or um, Hezekiah, where God turned time back. Um, so, so there's no way to explain it. So we shouldn't be hard on ourselves that we don't understand some of that stuff because we live inside of our human brains. What about those other seven uh, dimensions? You know, there's seven words for heaven in the Old Testament. We're not going to go through them all today. There's a good research project for you. What about those other seven? Well, let me, let me read you this <laughs> from Ezekiel 10, starting in verse 9. I looked, and each of the four cherubim had a wheel beside him, and wheels sparkled like beryl. All four wheels looked alike and were made the same. Each wheel had a second wheel turning crosswise within it. I can't do that. Okay? The cherubim, now listen, could move in any of the four direction, directions they faced without turning as they moved. Do you have any idea what's going on here? Because I don't. I tried to picture this, and my brain is not big enough to be able to manage what Ezekiel is describing. And think about him trying to describe this and write this down. They went straight in the direction they faced, never turning aside. Going on to Ezekiel 10, 15 to 17. Then the cherubim rose upward. These were the same living beings I had seen beside the Kibar River. When the cherubim moved, the wheels moved with them. When they lifted their wings to fly, the wheels stayed beside them. When the cherubim stopped, the wheels stopped. When they flew upward, the wheels rose. Now listen, for the spirit of the living beings was in the wheels. The angels. Wow. Is that just amazing? I can't figure it out. Here's the thing. God is not bound by the dimensionality that binds us. We live in three dimensions, or four dimensions. We live in this dimension of I can walk to the back of the room, I can walk to the back of the room, make a right and go into the sound room, I could go outside, go up on the roof and work on the air conditioner, and I can do that later this afternoon, but I'm not there right now and then I won't be there again later. I mean, just, just the, the four dimensions that we have to function in are hard enough to understand. Can you imagine trying to understand what these other dimensions are like, especially the spiritual dimensions? But God is not bound by that. Just like he wasn't bound by time, he's not bound by the dimensionality that binds us. God lives outside of time. How do we know that? What does the Bible say? I am the Alpha and I am the Omega. I have always been here. I will always be there. The words in the Bible are from everlasting to everlasting. God, there is no time when God wasn't here. And the only reason we don't understand it is that we're bound by time. Can you imagine what life would be like without time? What's heaven going to be like? There's no more time. To God, a thousand years is like what? A day. I think that's a pretty good way to describe the fact that he's not bound by the time constraints that we are. He's not dimensionally restricted. He created all the dimensions. I don't know how many dimensions there are. I don't have a clue. I know there's four. Because here I am, right? I don't know what goes on beyond that.
But if string theory is true, God created it. And I'm going to tell you why I think that string theory really, that there's, that there's a reality to it. And again, why every physicist who believes it isn't now a believer in Jesus Christ shocks me. And I'll tell you why. Luke 4, 28 to 30 says, when they heard this, the people in the synagogue were furious. Jumping up, they mobbed him and forced him to the edge of the hill on which the town was built. Who are we talking about here? Jesus. Jesus. Okay. They intended to push him off the cliff. And then what happened? But he passed right through the crowd and he went on his way. So some people say he became invisible. Did you ever watch the movie The Invisible Man when you were young? Anybody ever see it? Okay. The Invisible Man still had what? He had mass. The first law of thermodynamics says that, that matter cannot be created or destroyed, only altered in form, turned into energy. But you can't destroy it. It doesn't disappear. So you may become invisible, but you still occupy space. How many of you believe you have a guardian angel? How many believe that guardian angel is here right now? Bonita, how many folks here did you count? What do we have today? Okay, 38. So then, if our guardian angels were here, there's actually 76 of us here. Do you agree with me on that? Right? Okay. 76 people gets pretty crowded in here. And can you imagine if there were 38 invisible people, invisible beings taking up space, that when church service was over, we would simply be knocking each other over? with 38 invisible people trying to fit between all of us as we congregate in the aisles and whatnot. So where did Jesus go? How did he pass through a crowd of people? If we thought about it in the dimensionality of time, he was here and now he's not. And then he was over here, but he wasn't there before. So we could say that he somehow, he was able to to um, move through the concept of time to go from one place to another without passing in between. Tr transport it. Or maybe there's a fifth dimension, which is a spiritual dimension. Maybe that's where our, our angels are. So think about this. Our angels are here in a three-dimensional place. They're here right now in a fourth-dimensional allocation. We can't see them because they're in a fifth dimension which is simply a different space and time than we are. Is that possible? Okay. Again, I don't want to go beyond theories, beyond what the Bible tells us. But the Bible says it happened. Remember Jesus walked through walls? But they didn't have to replaster the wall when he walked through, did they? If he was invisible, taking up space, he would have punched a hole through the wall. But he didn't. He simply passed through because, because God lives in a spiritual dimension that we don't have to understand we just have to have faith Amen. that he created all of this and that he is in control. See, here's what this does for me. What this does for me is it gives me hope and faith in the problems that I have where I no longer understand a solution. When things get so bad for me that I can no longer figure out how to fix it myself, either I'm going to crash and burn or I'm going to have faith that God can handle it. Because if he can do all of that, then what problem could I possibly have that he couldn't manage? Read this in the beginning. So if string theory is true, what we're talking about it is the tension on the strings. And it's the resonance of those strings, the note that they play, that is responsible for the, the structure of everything that we have in the universe. Does that make sense? So what do we know about God's voice? This is so cool. It says, when God created the heavens and the earth, the earth was a shapeless, chaotic mass, and the Spirit of God brooding over the dark vapors. And then in Hebrews 11.3, it says, by faith we understand that the worlds were framed by the word of God, so that the things which are seen were not made of the things which are visible. So God created things. He created the universe out of nothingness, or it's just always been here. He created the earth, and in, in the Hebrew word is hovu vatovu, I believe is the expression. It's like helter skelter. It was this chaotic mess of nothingness. Hebrews 11.5 says, by faith, Enoch was taken away so that he did not see death and was found because God had taken him. 
And Hebrews 11, 7 says, By faith Noah, being divinely warned of things not yet seen. From a time perspective, they hadn't happened yet. Moved with godly fear, prepared an ark for the saving of his household. So if string theory is true, then it's supported in the Bible. Genesis 13, or 1, 3, and 4 says, then God did what? He did what? Yes. Meaning what? He spoke, and there was light. And then God spoke, and he made the sky dividing the vapor above from the water below. And God spoke, and let the water beneath the sky be gathered into oceans so that the dry land will emerge. And what happened? It was. And God spoke again, let the earth burst forth with every sort of grass and seed-bearing plant and fruit trees with seeds inside the fruit so that these seeds will produce the kinds of plants and fruits they came from. And what happened? And so it was. And God was pleased in Genesis 1.14. And God said, he spoke, let bright lights appear in the sky to give light to the earth. Listen, he spoke the sun and the moon into existence. I love reading Job where he basically says to God, why don't you come down here and let's just duke this out man to man. And God says, he says, you better prepare yourself because I'm about to ask you some questions. And you better stand for, fasten your seatbelt, Job, because it's about to get rocky. He said, where were you when the firmaments of the earth were created and the lightning came out of the sky and the lights were created in the universe? He didn't just make it light. <laughs> this is so far beyond me, guys. I don't even know how he can talk about it. He created the sun out of nothingness and the moon. That's the God that I worship. And they shall bring about the seasons on the earth. He caused the earth to rotate. And he keeps it together. The balance between gravity and centrifugal force is such that we don't fly off and we don't get crushed. We talked about last week we're around the circumference of the earth. It's about 35, 40 miles more than it is around the poles because the earth expands a bit from that. And so it was. And in Genesis 10, 21, God said, let the waters teem with fish and other life and let the skies be filled with birds of every kind. And what happened? 124, he said, let the earth bring forth every kind of animal, cattle, and reptiles, and wildlife of every kind. And what happened? So if string theory is true, and it's the resonance of these strings under tension that cause everything to exist, when God spoke, the resonance of his voice created everything that we know in the universe. Is that... Is that just incredible? How could you be a scientist and subscribe to string theory and not believe that God is the grand creator of all of this? He uses the physical world for us. In John 20, 19 to 20, it says, that evening the disciples were meeting behind locked doors in fear of the Jewish leaders when suddenly Jesus was standing there among them. It doesn't say he knocked, he walked in. All of a sudden, in space and time, he wasn't there, and now he is there, okay? It's not sleight of hand. It's a supernatural um, event. After greeting them, he showed them his hands and his side. Why did he do that? He used physical evidence to prove to them that he was Jesus Christ. Mark 6, 48 to 50 says, about 3 o'clock the morning, in the morning he walked out to them, How? Why? Did he have to do that? He could have just appeared to them in the boat like he appeared to them there, right? Couldn't he have? But why didn't he? Because he uses physical evidence for human beings to be able to better understand the supernatural powers that he has. When they saw something walking on the water beside them, they screamed in terror thinking it was a ghost for they all saw him. Isaiah 40.22 says, It is he who sits above the circle of the earth. What is the circle of the earth? The earth. And its inhabitants are like grasshoppers who 
who stretches out the heavens like a curtain and spreads them out like a tent to dwell in. If that doesn't sound like another dimension to you, or at least to me, I don't know what does. Luke 4, 28 and 30 says, So all those in the synagogue, when they heard these things, were filled with wrath and rose up and thrust him out of the city. And they led him to the brow and the hill on which their city was built, that they might throw him over, oh, we already read this, I'm sorry, over the cliff. And then passing through the midst of them, he went his way. In closing, I'm going to read from Psalms 29, 3 to 9. It says, the, what were we talking about here, string theory? It's about resonating sounds, right, that create everything. It says, the voice of the Lord echoes from the clouds. The God of glory thunders through the skies. So powerful is what? His voice, so full of majesty. It breaks down the cedars. It splits the giant trees of Lebanon. It shakes Mount Lebanon and Mount Syrian. They leap and skip before him like young calves. The voice of the Lord thunders through the lightning. It resounds through the desert and shakes the wilderness of Kadesh. The voice of the Lord spins and topples the mighty oaks. It strips the forest bare. They whirl and sway beneath the blast, but in his temple all are praising what? Glory, glory to the Lord. In Bible Commentary, Volume 5, page 1126, we read this. If Christ made all things, he existed before all things. No, it's not up there, sorry. It's in my notes. Listen again. If Christ made all things, so this is Boolean logic. Do you believe that Christ made all things? Yes. Okay. So if that's true, then he had to exist before all things. So how could God create something out of nothing? He had to be there before the something was created, and that explains singularity in the Big Bang Theory. The words spoken in regard to this are so decisive that no one be left in doubt. Christ was God essentially and in the highest sense. He was with God from all eternity. God overall, blessed forevermore. I went longer than I wanted to, but I could talk about this and not sleep for days. This is so much food. Well, we'll do our challenge later. But just think about how big a picture this is. Think about the immensity and the magnanimity of the God that we believe in who created everything out of nothing, who has been here before time and will be here after time. And then start to think about what is possibly going on in your life that God can't help fix. Amen? Amen. Amen. Thank you. Enough math for one day? No. I know. Until we met you, no. Think if our math teachers taught us math this way, how much more we would be into mathematics. You ever thought about that? That's right. I will, here, I'll tell you this. Because I, I just, I love math. I'm just obsessive about it. I am convinced that people who don't like math or didn't do well in math had poor math teachers. Because if our if your teachers were like my teachers and they showed you the miracles beyond it that was involved in this, you would be as obsessive about math as you are about the alphabet. I mean, if we didn't have the alphabet, you couldn't spell your name. I mean, think about that. Nobody ever said, oh, we're not going to use these letters any, anywhere in our life. But they said that about math. Oh, no one's going to use quadratic equations in the future, right? And so we all discounted. But look at us. Just look what the Bible tells us uh, about this amazing, awesome God we have. Anyways, go on. You know, I wish I'd have thought about this earlier. We're going to do this one day. If I were to take the collection plate and I gave everybody a small piece of paper 
and I asked you to write down your biggest problem in your life on that piece of paper, and you put it in that plate, and we passed it around, and we shook them up, and then I asked you to pull one out of there as we passed it around. I bet you a lot of you would wish for your problem back. I know I probably would. And I don't know whose problem I would get, but I know there are people that have much bigger problems than I do. So here's, here's my challenge for you. On this Sabbath day today, I want you to take some time after napping or eating or visiting, whatever you do, take some time and write down the three biggest challenges in your life right now. The three biggest things that are going on that are just challenging your relationship with God. And then I want you to pray on them. And I want you to go back into the Bible and take a look at the challenges that we read about people had in the Bible, whether it was Hezekiah or Job or Ezekiel, any of the prophets or any of the characters in the Bible. And I want you to think about which one of those problems are bigger than God. That's all. And then next week, if you find a problem in your life that's bigger than God, bring it to us. Because I've never seen one. My friend, um, Bob one time asked this question. He said, is, can God create a rock that he can't lift? And I thought, that's the dumbest question I've ever heard in my life. Why would you even contemplate something like that? You know, how about this? Is there a problem in my life today that is so big that God can't fix it? Because here's the danger. If you believe that's true, then you face uh, the risks of depression and suicide because we lose hope and there's no reason to be here anymore. None of us need to be in that position. So that's my challenge for you. Next week we can talk about that if you want to. Amen? Amen. If you'll bow your heads, I will close in my usual manner. Yivrecha Adonai v'yishma recha. Ya'ar Adonai panavalecha v'ikunecha. Yisaw Adonai panavalecha v'yashem lecha. Shalom. May the Lord bless you and keep you. May he cause his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord lift his countenance upon you and bring you peace. And everybody said? Amen. Amen. All right, sorry we ran long today, but I kind of knew that was going to happen when I started. So I appreciate your patience and your tolerance.